and welcome to episode 125 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. Uh, this is going to be the Small Scope Spectacular. I don't know. I don't know what the name of your of your presentation. What was it called there, Shane? I lost it there for a second. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to start the slideshow, and that might have been a bad idea. I should have That's probably right. just left it in editing mode. Um, so a, a, a while ago, um, about a month ago, actually, I, I did a, a presentation to the local astronomy club here in Regina about um, just the benefits or my, my joy with small telescopes. And we got some listener feedback stating that uh, a number of people were kind of interested in that presentation and were wondering if it was on YouTube or, or available yeah. anywhere. And I don't think it is. So uh, we're just going to do it here today. Um, yeah, well, I was, I'm was i really excited to hear. So, so we, we had a few people requesting this and one of those people was me. <laughs> <laughs> so you yeah. said something like, hey, we should do this. And I said, I thought you already were. So, um, yeah, no, I was really keen, uh, to hear this as, as, uh, another person who en enjoys small telescopes. Uh, I think this is pretty cool. So on, on the main part of the slide here, you have your, uh, well, this, this looks like the Borg, uh, 50 mini set up and, and looking out your back window. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and maybe before we really get into it, um, this presentation is on our website, actualastronomy.com, oh, or at cool. least, you know, when, when this episode drops, I'll make sure it's up there. So if you want to, um, uh, you know, listen to the podcast and then, you know, maybe follow along on your own computer, you can kind of click through the slides and, and, uh, get a bit of an understanding of what we're looking at too. So. Isn't that a finder scope, Shane? No. I <laughs> well, that that's a quote from our good buddy, Mike. I remember when we were out at Grasslands and, and you had your 60 millimeter tack. And I think this is the first time. And he said, like, did, like, why'd you bring your finder scope or something like that? <laughs> Which I thought was pretty funny. Yeah. So, um, what I started off with in this presentation was just a, a little bit of my telescope history. Uh, um, just to sort of state that I've looked through a lot of different apertures and a lot of different style of telescopes, and I've kind of had an evolution through my, uh, my history as an amateur astronomer. Um, you know, I started with what most people start with, which is a Dobsonian and it was an eight inch, which, you know, a lot of books will recommend as the go-to path. And you and I have recommended that even as a go-to path for somebody getting into the hobby. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, one of the things that I read early on in my days was you also need a three inch, uh, refractor. Um, they're super versatile. They do everything. So, uh, I ended up buying an 80 millimeter William optics, uh, apochromat, that I barely used. And I'll get into that throughout this presentation. Um, but you know, at that point in my life, I, I had aperture fever. So then I went into, or, or I acquired a 12 inch mead light bridge and used that for a number of years. And then, you know, I, I ended up with some Max Sudovs actually a couple of times, uh, five inch. Um, and then I really started getting into the world of, uh, refractors and, you know, any listeners of this podcast know us both as refractor observers primarily. And, um, you know, that, um, that's kind of my history. Um, I've looked through a lot of different glass as well, you know, uh, various sizes of, uh, obsessions, um, up to 20 inches, um, you know, and then really every inch of, uh, Dobsonians, uh, probably right down to the, you know, eight inch that I talked about. Uh, I've looked through many different cats of greens, 11s, nine and a quarters, eights, sixes, even, um, as well as some other, uh, Max Sudovs. So, um, you know, I've looked through a lot of glass and I got to say for me and the way I observe, I really like refractors in general, but I'm really gaining an infinity or an appreciation for the smaller ones, which is what we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. Now I got to say, uh, I do love big aperture. Um, I love looking through Mike's 12 inch. Uh, I love looking through any big glass whenever I get the chance. Um, but what, what I have on the screen right now is a, a fishing boat and, um, you know, I also enjoy fishing and I, I do have a boat, but there was a point in time when I didn't. And, uh, a good buddy of mine is a real, real avid fisherman who owns a boat. Um, so I asked him when I was starting out in my journey to buy a boat, I said, what, what's, you know, what should I look for in a boat? What, what's the best qualities? What do you recommend? And he said, well, I recommend you don't buy a boat and you just, you know, go out fishing with your buddy. Can I make uh, a comment? I got to yeah. make it. Yeah. Yeah. Buying a boat in Saskatchewan is kind of a lot like buying a telescope in Nova Scotia, but anyway, <laughs> hey, we have a lot of lakes here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, you don't think of Saskatchewan as being a place you buy uh, watercraft and in Nova Scotia, we have a lot of clouds. So <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. Um, but my buddy said the best boat that you'll ever enjoy is the one that is not yours. It's your buddy's boat. And he yeah. said, the reason is because you don't have to maintain it. You don't have to tow it. Um, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into, you know, a boat, right. And, and enjoying it. And I kind of think big aperture, at least for me is the exact same as a fishing boat. Um, I love it, but I love it when it's somebody else's problem to transport, to set up and to store. Um, so whenever I can steal a view, I will, and I really appreciate the people that bring those big telescopes. Uh, but I really love the ease of my, uh, of my refractors, particularly my little ones. Yeah. So anyway, as we get into this presentation, there are a couple of uh, assumptions. Um, when I'm talking about small telescopes, it will be only refractors um, and it will be strictly from a visual observing standpoint. So again, you know, I, I think anybody that listens to this podcast knows that that's kind of what we talk about most of the time anyways. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we also need some criteria about what a small telescope is, you know, what defines that. And uh, I think I think the number one thing for me anyway, is that it's stable on a real lightweight mount and a lightweight tripod. If, if that if it can be stable on that kind of a setup, it's it meets that criteria of a small telescope. So typically that will be less than 80 millimeters of aperture, but focal length is a big part of this equation too. So you know, probably f7.5 or less, and I, I have f10 on here in some circumstances. Um, and there's probably a few exceptions to this, uh, this criteria, but essentially what I'll talk about is, is 80 millimeters or less and around that F 7.5 or less. Mm -hmm. and then I, I have some pictures here. <laughs> so the one on the left, Chris is two 76 millimeter telescopes. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can see they're very different in size. So the one on the right is the TAC, which is F 7.5. And the one on the left is my old Tasco 10 TE, which I think is like an F 16, um, so this is why focal length is important because the one on the left is uh, 1200 millimeters long. And while the aperture fits the criteria of less than 80 millimeters, that focal length does not make it a small telescope. It's huge. Um, and it, you know, requires a substantial mount. Um, and then in the top right, I have the little Borg mini 50 millimeter, 50 millimeter, which is an F5 beside an old Zeiss uh, Acromat, which is a 50 millimeter, but it's an F10.4. And again, like there's a real substantial difference in the physical size of this thing, um, in terms of how easy it is to set up and mount and blah, 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 blah. Um, so some stuff that I like about these small telescopes, and I think you're probably in the same boat, Chris, um, is, uh, there, there's a number of things that just, uh, make the quality of life uh, you know, using the thing really nice, but also the views. Mm -hmm. Um, so I love the portability, you know, we've mentioned this many times. Um, I love the mountability and I'm not sure that's a real word. I think I maybe just made that up. It's um, now a word. It's now a word. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what I mean by mountability is that, um, you, you don't have to invest in a real heavyweight expensive tripod or a real heavyweight expensive mount in order to avoid vibrations. Um, you know, a small telescope can go on, you know, just about anything and probably, uh, be very stable for you to view, uh, very fast cooling. You know, there's, that was probably one of the biggest issues I had with the Max Sudovs that I owned way back in the day was that they would take a long time to cool off when I take them outside. Yeah. And our little doublet refractors are almost in some cases like instant, like, especially like the little Borg 50 millimeter, there is no cool down time required for that little yeah. telescope. It just is ready to go. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you've mentioned this uh, a million times on this podcast, but it's, you know, the wide field or ultra wide field views that refractors yeah. provide yeah. is a big draw. Um, yeah. you just don't get that from, uh, you know, the big Newtonians or the Casa greens. Um, so, you know, that, that's something that does appeal to me for sure. Um, and then the last one here that I have on this page is, is the comfort. And I know this one is, uh, again, I think pretty near and dear to your heart. Um, but like, you know, with a refractor, you can basically, you know, cater your tripod and mount and everything so that the eyepiece is at the perfect level for you to observe at while standing. And, um, I'm not a huge, like I, I, I don't always stand and observe, 
But like for the shorter sessions, like if I'm going out in the backyard for 30 minutes or an hour, um, I don't want to drag out a chair necessarily because that's just another thing. So if I can observe while standing, you know, that just makes it even that much better. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Just have the flexibility of doing that is, uh, yeah. Yeah. That, that definitely is something I was going for. That's, that's why I bought the little pillar for my, um, Brilla back tripod is so that I could, um, you know, I can, can go out and especially for viewing like comets on the horizon, then I don't need to take a chair with me. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then I, I have a, a quote here from somebody on cloudy nights. I should have probably uh, got the poster's name, uh, but I didn't. And um, he said that the first three inches is the most important. So three inches would be an 80 millimeter refractor. Yep. Um, the first three inches is the most important because you get a four magnitude gain over the unaided eye. Uh, to gain another four magnitudes from that point would require an aperture of 20 inches uh, or more. Yeah. And um, that is fairly true. Like, you know, if you look on the various um, sort of app, what can I see with this aperture scale? Uh, that that is pretty darn close, and yep. uh, I thought that's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's it's surprising. Like, um, you know, like there's there's some big differences going from like my four inch to a twelve inch. Um, like, yeah, th- there definitely is some pretty big differences. But on on a, on a lot of objects like this this faint globular we were looking at the other night, Mike and I, um, yeah, you could see it better in the twelve, but it was still really difficult to see. Like, I don't know that. Um, you know, this, the same experienced observer, you know, w- wouldn't see them as, as worlds of difference. Like, you know, we were surprised how faint it looked, um, in the four inch, it was like, I thought I was seeing it turned out I was seeing it basically the 12 inch just confirmed that we were seeing it cause it, it's able to grab another couple magnitudes. Um, but it's not like, Oh, we can hardly see it in a four inch. Now it's beating us over the head in a 12 inch. It's, it's not like that at all. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a good point. Um, so I, I talked like, about, I like this photo. <laughs> I knew, I knew you. So, <laughs> so the reason why I like this photo for those that are just listening is Shane's got a picture of his tiny telescope, the 50 millimeter Acromat and, uh, and beside it, well, let's see, he's, he's got a variety of accessories and they all have these beautiful yellow caps. And then for scale, he has a beautiful yellow ripe banana. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and which also can serve as a midnight snack when you're hungry observing. Um, right. And, yeah. and Shane is bananas over small telescope. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Sorry, so th- this is a monkey around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it just don't stop. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I just kind of slipped on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm taking over again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is all about, uh, so this slide here is talking about the portability. So I, I have by my back door, a tripod and my 76 millimeter tack set up. And, um, it, when I'm going out, that thing is in one hand, I've got my eyepiece case over a shoulder. I've got an Atlas in my other hand. I've got a red light around my neck and I'm ready to go out the door in one trip and observe. And again, that's why I really like this stuff because or why I like these small telescopes, because it is just so easy to, to head out and, and do your observing. And the picture that Chris just described is probably my most, my, my ultimate portability setup. So it's the little 50 millimeter Borg. It is a uh, Bader Zeiss prism, inch and a quarter, uh, so very small, very lightweight. Uh, I have the 24 millimeter inch and a quarter teleview panoptic, which uh, provides a, a fairly wide field of view in that telescope. And then right beside it is I have a Nikon MC2 zoom. Now it's for a spotting telescope, but you can easily adapt it for inch and a quarter. And um, it provides fields of view or sorry, focal lengths from nine millimeters to 21. So it really gives me a real good range after the panoptic. And um, it's not the widest field of views. Like it's like, I think a 45 degree field of view eyepiece. Uh, It's extremely sharp. And the thing is, is that I think the 45 degrees in, in that Borg telescope, um, still give me like a four degree field at nine millimeter focal length. So, you know, it, it's still it, like everything's relative. And even though that eyepiece isn't a wide field eyepiece, it still provides a pretty wide field view in that little telescope. And it's super light, like that eyepiece barely weighs anything. And, uh, again, it's, a, it's a great part of my little portable setup here. Nice. Um, and then I just have some more photos of the little Borg, you know, beside a can of soda. 
Um, and you know, the or little pops, lens, we call it. yeah, yeah. Uh, the lens cell unscrews, you know, from the board and that literally could go in, in your top shirt pocket. You know, if, if you have uh, if you have one of those pockets and, uh, you know, if you're flying or traveling, you, you then have the most valuable part of your telescope, you know, well protected on you, not in your luggage and the rest of the tubes and everything can, you know, go in your checked bag and, you know, you don't have to worry about, um, you know, broken glass or anything when you arrive. Yeah. And you also get to have the fun of telling people you have a telescope in your pocket. <laughs> that's, that's right. It's a lot. It's, you know, what's funner than that really? So. <laughs> Nothing. <in my> Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> So again, just some more photos to show some portability aspects. So I have my uh, 61 millimeter William optic telescope beside the Borg. Um, it's kind of funny because the, the 61 millimeter telescope looks like a ginormous telescope beside the Borg, yeah. but it's really still quite a small portable uh, unit. And then on the right, I, I have a Pelican 1500 case, which is uh, you know a very good case for protecting your gear, but it also fits uh, through your carry-on luggage if you're flying. Mm -hmm. And you can see, you know, in the bottom photo there, Chris, on the right, that the 61 millimeter fits very well with a two inch diagonal. I've mm -hmm. got the red dot finder in there and there's a boatload of real estate available for eyepieces or whatever else. Uh, I just have to cut some holes in that pluck foam and I, I can fit whatever I want in there. Mm -hmm. Um, so the ultra wide fields or the wide fields, um, you know, we talked about this or we have talked about this many times. Um, this is a big draw for these little refractors. And what I've listed here is, uh, just what I get through my various small telescopes when using a 41 millimeter pen optic. Um, so the 41 millimeter pan gives you the widest field of view uh, that you can get with a two inch eyepiece. And in my 50 millimeter, you get 11 degrees ish. In my 61 millimeter, uh, seven and three quarters. In my TAC, 76, it's uh, just a hair under five degrees. And then in my old light bridge, <laughs> it comes in at 1.86 degrees. So, you know, all of a sudden we go real, I shouldn't say real narrow, two degree field is still pretty good, but uh, substantially smaller uh, than my refractors. Hmm. So what does that mean, Chris? You know, here is a uh, image of, so this is out of Sky Safari. Um, and in Sky Safari, you can uh, transpose like, like a field of view rings uh, at whatever degree measurement that you want. So all of those ones on the last slide are on here. And in the middle, what I did is I, I put the veil nebula. So the veil through my old light bridge with a 1.9 degree field of view um, you, you can't see all of the veil in one field of view. Uh, you would have to pan around to take it all in. Um, but then with the other field of views that I have with that pan optic and my various other refractors, it's no problem to fit the entire structure, uh, into that field of view. Um, so just to give it a bit of context about what each one of these telescopes would provide. Um, you know, and then here's a sh the same shot with a, a full moon. And then um, Comet Neowise, you know, which was, you know, I yep. guess it's getting to be uh, almost a year old now where we were starting to observe that. But that, uh, I believe the tail and from, you know, nucleus to the end of the tail was over eight degrees, if I'm not yeah. mistaken, at some point. And uh, that's, you know, a rare occurrence, but it's an example of where these wide field or ultra wide field telescopes really uh, begin to shine. Nice. And then uh, the last one here that I have just with the, the degree field of view is, is Malot 20, which we actually talked about again, uh, you know, a couple months ago when it was more prominent in the sky. Malot 20 is this huge uh, uh, stellar, stellar association, or, you know, kind of almost looks like a big open cluster. And, um, you know, you need, uh, you need over five degrees really to take all of that in. Mm -hmm. And again, you, you're not going to get that with a, a lot of telescopes unless you have the right refractor, probably, uh, in a, in a, in order to pull that all in within one field of view. Yeah. So, um, I thought, you know, I would do a little math here as well and just find out. So, you know, if my old light bridge uh, is just a hair under two degrees, uh, in terms of maximum field of view, how many objects are greater than two degrees? So how many objects would I not be able to fit in that field of view using my old light bridge? So I used Sky Safari again, and in Sky Safari, you can generate your own custom lists based on all sorts of uh, parameters and criteria. 
Um, I, I, so I, I, I think I put, yeah, I just put in greater than two degrees and there is 640 objects, uh, that sky safari, um, came up with on this list. Yeah. Um, so 405 of them are dark nebula, which, you know, I don't think dark nebula really get the, the love and attention they deserve. Um, they're kind of a unique object, I guess, from a visual standpoint. Um, but, uh, there's a lot of those out there. Um, now the next number is a little misleading. There's 198 bright nebula. So, you know, nebulas that have, uh, some kind of light coming from them. Um, but only 10 of them have known magnitudes. So I think the, the majority of those are probably not visual nebula. Uh, there's 33 open clusters greater than two degrees. And there are four galaxies, uh, that span greater than two degrees out there. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, how many of these have you observed now? Oh, gee, uh, through, through, um, the refractors. I don't know. I'd have to look at my, my logs, I guess. Um, huh. I'm not too sure. How about you? Lots of them. Lot, lots. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so Chris, do you know what the image is on the left here? So is that the alpha Perseid cluster or is it that is, the delta? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. It is. yeah. I was going to yeah. say though, it, it looks like a reverse of the uh, Colander 70 cluster that's in uh, Orion's belt too, but the the S is is upside down and on the wrong side of that star. But that looks like um, Alpha Persei. Yeah, one. correct, which is a, a beautiful cluster or a beautiful collection of stars. And then yep. um, on the right, we have uh, M45, the Pleiades, which is another amazing yep. site. Like no matter what telescope you're using with the Pleiades, it's incredible. But if you ever... Um, like if you have a Dobsonian or, or a Cassegrain, I'm sure you've enjoyed views of the Pleiades, but if you have binoculars, use those one time, or if you can get a wide field view of this open cluster, it is just magical when you can take it all in, in one field of view. And then in the bottom right, uh, is an interesting dark nebula that, um, you know, you're, you pointed this one out to me one night at, um, uh, grasslands, because this is one that, uh, you know, I've. I don't remember actually seeing it with the naked eye um, outside of grasslands. And it goes by a couple of different names. And, uh, and one is the, is it the prancing horse? The dark prancing horse. Yeah. Dark prancing horse, yeah. That, that's what Alan Whitman calls it. He's a contributor to, to sky and telescope uh, magazine, deep sky editor. And uh, uh, also I've, I've observed with him fortunately a few times and I think he's the one that first pointed it out to me. Yeah, it, it's a really, really big object. And um, uh, the what's the other one? The pipe, or is it just called the pipe? Yeah, it's called the the pipe and the bowl. So the pipe is the is the sort of long, or the stem is the long, narrow part, and then the the bowl is is kind of like, I guess, the place where you would you would put your tobacco or, or, or smoking substance of choice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, this is one of those objects where I see both, you know, I can see the pipe and then, you know, what looks like kind of smoke billowing from it or, you know, where the kind of the stem of the pipe is, that's the horse's back leg. And then that, you know, what I just described as billowing smoke is actually kind of the horse's torso and body. And then some front legs that have a bit of a bend in it. So it sort of looks like it's prancing and then, you know, the, the elongated horse's head and, uh, kind of a, a real neat, uh, dark nebula in the middle of the, this, well, not in the middle, but near the horizon, uh, in the Northern hemisphere, um, of our, uh, Milky Way galaxy in the summertime. Yeah. All right. The word I made up mountability, I think I've probably talked about this enough, but you know, these little light telescopes can use little light mounts and tripods and still provide real sturdy uh, views. Uh, you have a great little, uh, mount from, uh, universal astronomics. How much does that weigh, Chris? Eight ounces, same as a can of pop or soda for our American listeners. <laughs> and, and I think on our last episode, like you mentioned this mount, just, it can fit in a pocket. Uh, it is just oh, that yeah. small. Yeah. yeah, it is. Absolutely. It's small enough to go in, in a pocket. See, I always wanted to have a telescope that I could wear fully dressed. Uh, <laughs> so I, I can have the, the, the lens assembly in one pocket. I can have the tube in another, in another pocket. I can have the mount in another pocket, you know, maybe a really short tabletop tripod, a small diagonal and a small eyepiece in another. I always thought that'd be cool just to walk in somewhere and, you know, and say, Hey, like, we, we should observe. I, I've got my telescope on me. Just like start pulling it out of pockets. Right? 
<laughs> yeah, that would be kind of neat. Um, yeah, you know, this this is a, a great aspect of the small telescopes because this allows you to do like the the one-handed carry, you know, with the telescope already mounted, take it outside. It allows you to move it around the yard very easily. And if you are, again, if you're flying, there's weight restrictions and all of that kind of stuff. Um, it is nice to have something as light as possible to help get around some of those, uh, those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked a little bit about cooling, um, but they, they cool exceptionally fast. Now, you know, there is one assumption here when I'm talking about this, and that's that we're talking about a doublet refractor. If we're talking about a triplet or a quad, forget it. Those do take a while to cool down or certainly a lot longer than our doublet friends here. Um, but the doublets really do, uh, um, acclimatize real fast, like a, a 50 to a 60 millimeter is almost no time needed at all. You can probably begin observing for sure at like a low power. And, um, you know, the, the amount of cooling would be not very much, uh, like, I'm trying to think here, you know, my 60 millimeter going from inside to outside, um, you know, in the winter time, which can be like a 40 degree temperature swing is probably ready in about 10 minutes, maybe even, you know, a little less. Mm -hmm. Um, and this last winter, when I was taking out this, uh, 76 millimeter Takahashi in 20 to 30 minutes, I, I was not able to see any, um, like, uh, heating issues within the tube. And, and the way you do that is just with a star test. You can tell if there's any tube currents, uh, that are, you know, kind of giving you grief, but yep. um, it was ready to go real fast. And, uh, how long would it take? Do you think, Chris, if you're doing a, a 40, well, let's even just say a, maybe a 20 degree temperature swing. Um, how long would it take, say a Cassegrain or a Maxudov or a Newtonian to acclimatize or at least get close to that outdoor temperature? Yeah, I don't know. Like you're probably you're probably banked on an hour though now. Like I know people are wrapping their tubes like in that that, that silver wrap and are, are getting good results. But like I, yeah, just like sort of naked traditionally setting it up, you're you're looking at least an hour, I would mm -hmm. imagine. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what your thoughts are. Maybe 45 minutes if it's not if it's not too bad. But uh yeah. but yeah, 40 degree temperature drop. Yeah, I mean you gotta factor in at least a minute a degree, at least. I mean, you think about that, mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like like much a um, minute a degree, but, uh, yeah. So I would say three quarters of an hour before it's, it's really just getting going. Yeah, for sure. And, and I know like with the, with the bigger, uh, Newtonians, uh, a lot of the mirrors will have fans to help, you know, um, uh, expedite the cooling process. And, uh, for caster grains, you can buy like these coolers that like, it's a big tube that kind of goes in the, uh, the visual back yeah. and it circulates the air, which, uh, is supposed to expedite it as well. Yeah. Um, so there are little tricks to help you know, those yeah. bigger telescopes, uh, cool down quicker. Um, but certainly a, a doublet refractor is, uh, one of the most efficient ones just kind of in its native format. Yeah. You know, you know, did you ever, did you ever hear about the fans for the, uh, for the refractors? No, it's you and I oh. <laughs> <laughs> next slide. <laughs> <laughs> and I got the hook. Wait, why yeah, am yeah. I <laughs> You know what? I've, I've read something interesting recently. I've been doing some research because I might get a little reflector. Oh, and and uh, like I'm like I'm looking for a used one of mm -hmm. a certain of a certain type and brand. And so the one thing the one thing I read and it was it was a very experienced observer. I think it's Alan. No, I can't can't remember who it was. It wasn't Alan French. It might have been. Um, but anyway, there were some experienced observers like deep in the recesses of of Clyde and talking about this, um, in the, in the distant past. And, and what they had done is actually remove all the paint from their Newtonians and just left them as, as bare metal. And apparently that has huge thermal improvement, uh, characteristics when, when that's done. So I was thinking I might, I'm going to try to get like a used eight inch and strip it. Hmm. Like I'll take all the paint off and then like, I'll do an experiment. I'll, I'll see how it is with the paint and then I'll see how it is without the paint. This is, this is like a long-term, probably not even this year kind of thing. I got mm -hmm. so many little starting projects on the go right now, but, but at some point I'm going to run this, uh, run this experiment. Anyway, keep going with your presentation. Sure. So, um, the slide that I have up right now is, uh, it's titled cater to the aperture. And, um, this was probably my biggest mistake that I made early on in my refractor days. Um, I, I had purchased that 80 millimeter William optics Apo, and it, it really was a good telescope. Uh, I've sold it. Um, once I got the Takahashi cause, uh, the TAC was basically the same, uh, aperture. Um, 
but I, I didn't use that William optics, uh, because I was never happy with it. I was never happy with the performance. Um, so I had, a an eight inch Dobsonian and then I, you know, uh, upgraded to a 12 inch Dobsonian. And the problem that I was making or, or the mistake I was making was that I was trying to use that 80 millimeter telescope to observe the same things that I was observing in those big Dobsonians and expecting, you know, to see wonderful sights. And that's just not the way you use these little telescopes. Um, you, you really need to observe objects that those telescopes are sort of uh, made for or objects that will show better in those refractors. And um, again, I just didn't really do that um, until I had, I was almost forced to. So what had happened is um, there's the Saskatchewan summer star party uh, that happens in Cypress Hills uh, every summer when there's not a pandemic. And there's uh, there's public observing that we do there like every night um, as part of the event. So I had uh, loaded up my 12 inch light bridge in my SUV and I loaded up uh, the 80 millimeter William optics, although I really had no intent of using it. I was just bringing it for, I don't even know why. Um, so I travel, uh, it's about 450 kilometers there. And uh, the first night we're doing um, public observing. It's in this tennis court area. I, I drive my SUV up there. I, I take the lower tube assembly out for my light bridge, set it down. Um, you know, I, I mount or I put it all together, put the trusses on. And, uh, the next step is to collimate it because, you know, with these truss style telescopes, you, you have to adjust the mirror every time. And, uh, so I put my laser collimator in and then I'm reaching under the lower tube assembly for my collimation bolts to start adjusting things. And I can't feel any collimation bolts. Uh, and I go all the way around and there's none there. And I thought, what has happened here? Um, and the other thing is there's also three like mirror locking bolts. So like once you get it collimated, you, you adjust these lock bolts just to help keep it in the right place. All of those were missing as well. And I was perplexed. I had no idea what had happened. Um, and it's getting dark now, you know, it's uh, the sun setting, it's hard to see. So I, I go look in the back of my SUV and I happen to catch uh, out of the corner of my eye, one of the collimation bolts and a couple of springs on the, like on the back, uh, back carpet there in, in the SUV. And what had happened is I had put like the, the wood base in the back and then I put the uh, lower tube assembly in the wood base and like, there's no real cushioning there. So as I'm driving 450 kilometers, that constant sort of road vibration just loosened all of those collimation bolts and all of those locking bolts, and they had all fallen out and the springs kind of exploded out. So I had a real mess and there was no way I was going to put that back together again that night. Um, so I pulled out the 80 millimeter William optics out of necessity because I needed to have a telescope. And I got to say, I was actually blown away that night with how good it was. And I think that was really the, the catalyst for me to start thinking about refractors as my primary observing instrument. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, some views that really stand out for me that night were, uh, M 81 and 82, um, you know, under a dark sky, those, and, and because they're brighter galaxies, um, you know, they really weren't too far off in terms of detail and, uh, beauty, uh, as what I'd seen in some of my larger instruments. Um, and it was kind of neat to be able to see them, you know, in a bigger field of view. Um, but the other thing that really shocked me was how good it was on the planets. I had never thought that an 80 millimeter telescope would show you much on say Jupiter, but the detail of the cloud bands and the festoons, um, and then that night, um, I think it was Callisto maybe had come out from behind Jupiter, you know, so you could kind of watch it as it extended, you know, further and further away. And, um, you know, again, out of necessity, I was really, really impressed with that telescope. Um, so anyway, where I'm going in a long winded way here is with these little telescopes, um, you know, they really shine when you start to observe some of the things that look good in them. So what are those objects? Well, uh, anything in the solar system, essentially. So, you know, planets, um, will be really good. Um, now, you know, probably closer to the 80 millimeter side, but you've had some outstanding Mars observations, even in your 60 millimeter yeah. um, that you shared. And uh, even Venus, I think you were using your 60 millimeter a lot last year to see Venetian clouds, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but the sun with proper filtering, uh, looks great through these little telescopes. Like I'm using a 50 millimeter and a 35 millimeter. Uh, so the 35 millimeter is an H alpha telescope, the 50 millimeter, I have the Herschel wedge in for white light. Um, you know, the sun looks amazing in those, uh, asteroids, bright comets, you know, little telescopes would be great there. Um, you know, double stars, double stars are one of the most adaptable set of objects you can look at. You know, using your planetarium software, you can create custom lists based on magnitude and separation. So you can cater a list to the size of aperture you're observing with. Um, we've talked a lot about open clusters. A lot of these things are big and uh, look amazing through little telescopes. Um, you know, all kinds of nebula, the stellar associations. There's an awful lot of objects to observe uh, with a small telescope. But in addition to that, in, in many cases, will look better in a small telescope because of their wider field of view. Mm -hmm. hmm. So Chris, I don't know if you've seen these sketches before. Um, this blew my mind. So I'm going to start with the ones on the right-hand side. So what we're looking at here is some sketches uh, that uh, somebody on Cloudy Nights did. And again, I, I apologize. I really should have uh, written down the poster's name, uh, but no way am I taking credit for these. Um, so this person has one of the, you know, uh, popular ST80 um, acromatic F5 telescopes that, uh, you know, I know you love, Chris. You've had yeah, a couple I love them. Of them. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. yeah. So, so on the right, we have two sketches of the planets. One is Jupiter, one is Saturn. And the detail on Jupiter is incredible. Um, you know, the, uh, the northern and southern polar regions are well-defined. Uh, the northern and southern equatorial bands are well-defined with some varying color there as well. But in addition, like there's varying detail. Like it's not just like the bands. There's actually some jaggedness there. There's, um, you know, uh, like in the Southern equatorial band, there's another sort of uh, lighter band underneath it that this person was able to capture. Yep. It, it's really an outstanding uh, sketch in my mind. And also the, again, the level of detail that was uh, gained from a 80 millimeter was, was really good. Yeah. But and doesn't even stop down to an inch of aperture there on the sketch on the well, left. Well, that that's on the left one. The 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 planets he was using full on. Uh, oh, three using, okay. Yeah, yeah, he was using it all. Um, and then Saturn, uh, you know, the Cassini division is quite evident. But yeah. even more impressive, I think, is the banding on Saturn that he captured. Um, you know, that can be subtle and difficult. Um, you know, for for any telescope sometimes. Um, yeah. But well captured with this one. But yeah, the one on the left here is the one that really shocked me. So he stopped this thing down to one inch of aperture and there are three galaxies that he's sketched in this field of view. So we got M31, 32 and 110 uh, mm. with one inch of aperture, <laughs> which, uh, you know, is just, wow, um, quite shocking. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, thinking about it though, I mean, you kind of got, uh, you know, you're, you're getting, you're increasing something. And, and what you're, what you're increasing there is the sky performance, right? So mm -hmm. you're not taking in as, as large a column of air and in our atmosphere. And because of that, you know, you've really reduced like atmospheric impacts, uh, on, on the optical system. And, uh, and again, like you think about the fact that, well, you know, if they went to, uh, an inch was, you know, like basically getting close to 28 millimeters. Uh, that that increases you know the the size of the aperture by four times than than what the eye can see alone anyway mm. so you know and i don't i don't know what the the square of that would be or the round of it i guess but uh yeah i mean really you're taking you're taking in like a lot more than the animated eye and you know nicholas de Kai, who who observed i think in the late 1700s staff first observer really going to the southern hemisphere discovered 42 or 43 objects um you know, and, and he did all of his observing with half inch telescopes. Wow. You know, I think at around like 20 power and, and credited for finding, you know, some of those first constellations uh, and well, naming the first constellations um, for the Western hemisphere anyway, because the, uh, you know, early peoples in, in that area had their own names and own constellations. But, um, but, but as far as finding like deep sky objects, you know, he, he did find a lot of those original ones uh, through like a tiny little scope that most people wouldn't even, you know, say is that's hardly a finder, like a 13 millimeter telescope is what he was using. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. So, so just a reminder to everybody listening, 
you know, even if you don't care about this presentation, like seeing this presentation, I think it's worth downloading this just to have a look at these three sketches uh, through a, a small telescope that you can buy for like a hundred and what twenty Canadian dollars, something like that. Something uh, like that, yeah. Yeah, super capable telescope. So uh, very cool, I thought. For sure. All right. Um, some just some memorable observations that I've had with some small telescopes. So I already mentioned like this Jupiter Moon transit uh, at the Star Party. Um, I've hand tracked uh, the International Space Station through a, a 63 millimeter telescope. Comet Neowise was incredible. Uh, the last Mars opposition, I exclusively used my 76 millimeter, which was amazing. Um, the entire veil nebula unfiltered under a real dark sky is, uh, you know, that's etched into my memory. And, and then the, uh, 2017 solar eclipse, uh, down in Wyoming, uh, again, was amazing. I, I had my 80 millimeter, uh, William optic with me there and, uh, my, my Lunt 35. Um, so those are just a, a handful of some great observations. I'm sure you've got probably a, a list as well, Chris, of some that really stand out for you. Yeah, no, all kinds, but you know, I think you've, uh, you've covered it well. So yeah, again, like just seeing those, uh, you know, just the different things that you can see through, through small, small apertures, you know, is, is really quite, uh, quite amazing. And then just the portability again, like you say, you know, to be able to take, uh, like a 60 million, good, really good 60 millimeter scope, um, you know, and travel with it is, is just, is just incredible, you know, because again, like, you know, when, when I've traveled with my 60 mil, um, you know, going to the places that, that I go, there's no way like that's my maximum telescope. In fact, sometimes, you know, it's really difficult to get all the little parts in, even though like I could probably put them all in a coat, like when you're trying to pack for trips that are sometimes a few weeks long, um, you know, it can be difficult. So I'm putting, you know, a part in, you know, my spouse's suitcase and, you know, and here and there and just jamming them in where I can, you know, um, and, and that's it. That's, that's, you're, you're already at your maximum capacity, even with the absolute minimum uh, telescope that, that you can, that you can take with you. But, uh, but then when you get there, it, it's, it's really cool. You know, it's incredible. It's incredible to go. And then you meet up with an old observing friend and, and they're like, well, you probably didn't bring a telescope. You're like, no, I brought it. You know, I brought a Takahashi with me. And they think, ah, 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 that's funny. I'm like, no, no, I did. I got it. I got it right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's pretty cool. All right. Um, some resources. So we're getting towards the end of this thing here. Um, you know, if you're looking for some guides or, or if you're kind of wondering, well, what should I look at with my little telescope? Um, there's the bright star Atlas, which I've talked about a few times. Now this one is getting harder to find because it's out of print. Uh, but if you can find one, it's, it's geared towards smaller gear. Um, and it has a, a nice layout that every page, uh, you know, shows a bunch of constellations on the right. And then on the left, it shows all of the objects that are there, like fairly bright objects, uh, but it's categorized, you know, by cluster, like open cluster, globular galaxies, on and on and on. Thanks. Uh, binocular guides are great. You know, any binocular guide will... Uh, be a real good guide for a small telescope. Um, you know, Chris, you've talked about many of these, um, and I bought one based on your recommendation and I love it, uh, which is, uh, Phil Harrington's book. Um, oh, what the heck is it? Something where I got it right. Yeah. Tour, touring the universe through binoculars. Um, that's a great one. Can I go back here? Um, some real old lists, like uh, the old observers, like you mentioned uh, in the past, have used smaller aperture telescopes. So, you know, sometimes that, uh, that can help you out. Um, and then a lot of planning software for astronomy or planetarium software will allow you to configure custom lists based on whatever criteria you want, like magnitude or size or whatever. And, um, you know, that, that is an option. And then, you know, the Messier list is, is a good one because there's a lot of bright objects there. Um, and then the RASC, so the, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada has some lists that are available to anyone. Uh, you know, the double star list, there's various lunar lists, um, and those are all awesome through little telescopes. Yeah. And uh, I, think, I think you mentioned the double star list. Yes. Yeah. The double yeah. star list is really good. I'm having a lot of fun with that one right now with my 76 millimeter. Yeah, I was chatting with uh, the the individual who made that up, uh, Blake, uh, again recently. And uh, anyway, he he appreciate you mentioning it. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah <thank> you. <laughs> um, now this one is kind of uh, 
uh, I don't know. I think this would be a, a lesson in frustration for me, but it's a very interesting accomplishment. Um, and this is a, a J Reynolds Freeman completed the Herschel. I think it was the Herschel 400, yeah. uh, with a 55 millimeter, uh, F eight Vixen Apocrymat. And he did this from like an urban, like an urban location. So it was light polluted. Uh, I think it was magnitude 5.3 in his article. Mm-hmm. Um, if this has, you know, if this intrigues you at all, just uh, do an internet search for J Reynolds Freeman, Herschel 400. There's like a four page PDF where he talks about it. Um, the key things that I, that I've put on this slide though, are his tips, uh, for observing this kind of stuff. And, um, so what he said was, um, use a higher magnification than you would, uh, use under a dark sky, um, because this will produce a, you know, a darker sky or darker background. So you, you know, can get a little bit more of a contrast variation with the object. Um, he said averted vision is a must, you know, our eyes are, you know, have some instinctual, uh, designs in them to catch movement, you know, out of, uh, out of your peripheral, whether, you know, it was a threat against us, you know, many, many years ago, or, you know, food that we could maybe acquire, you know, that was kind of the purpose of, of, or why our eye is stimulated by movement in the peripheral. Um, so sometimes like, um, uh, actually I'm kind of skipping down now to the next one here is a telescope jiggle. will 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 stimulate the eye to see some of these, um, you know, dimmer objects. So, you know, tapping the telescope to create a vibration or just racking things in and out of focus sometimes will allow you to see some faint objects. Uh, he talked about protecting your observing eye when you're not looking through the eyepiece. So some people use the old pirate patch, uh, but you could just cup your eye as well. See, I'm not sure this works. This yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. I know there's like, some different thoughts on that. Yeah. I'm just curious to see, cause I think you're, you're going to give it a run and I'm just really curious, curious to see because like the, the eye doesn't work like that, right? The eye works in conjunction with, with the brain and the mind. And that if, if one eye is exposed to bright light, the other eye will actually um, also respond to the bright light because they're they're You have like binocular vision, right? Yep. You, you have binocular vision, whether you want it or not kind of thing. You can't just, you can't just shut it off. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. But anyway, I, I'm curious, like I, I'm willing to, to experiment on this and um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to shell out the money. I'm just going to, going to put a piece of duct tape over my eye um, <laughs> for the, I'm sure this will, this will have no painful, you know, and I'll have lots of long lashes. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I like we'll, your we'll idea. Give it, we'll give it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so two more tips from Jay. He said, you know, you have to be persistent when trying a list like this with such a small telescope, he would spend tens of minutes just for one object and sometimes not even see it. So he'd have to come back and do it all over again. Um, now everything that I just talked about was not new news to me, but the last one made a lot of sense that I never had given a lot of thought. Um, and what he said was he needed absolutely precise star charts for this and not precise in terms of star placement, but precise in terms of showing only the stars that would be visible through his telescope at a given magnification. So he was using some magnitude 11 charts because that was about as deep as his little 55 millimeter could go. Because what he would have to do first is get the star field lined up perfectly. So he knew exactly where this Herschel 400 object should be. And then he would begin trying to observe it seeing if he could detect this faint light. Uh, you know, most of these Herschel objects are, are faint galaxies. And um, it does make a lot of sense to match your, your star chart magnitude to the you know, magnitude that your telescope can pull in. So mm-hmm. anyway, I'm not trying this anytime soon and likely never, but uh, a very interesting project nonetheless. Mm. Um, and the last thing here uh, that I wanted to leave with the folks when I presented this to the club was that uh, small telescopes are not better or worse than large telescopes. They're just different. And, you know, if, if you're into you know carpentry or anything like that, you need the right tool for the job. And sometimes a small telescope is the right tool for the job, depending on what you're looking at. Mm. Um, but I still love my large telescopes. I love looking through them. Um, you know, I said that, you know, my, my little, uh, my 76 millimeter telescope can fit the entire veil in one field of view, which is really cool. But I tell you, you know, there's nothing quite like looking at the veil through a 20 inch Dobsonian and and seeing all of the the filaments and the structure within the veil. Um, so, you know, all views are, are, you know, good. Uh, it's just, they're, you know, they're different. And sometimes the wide field, lower magnification, less aperture, 
uh, sometimes that provides a, a better view. But mm-hmm. anyway, I'm done blabbering. <laughs> no, that was really that was really good. Yeah, no, I really really enjoyed that, Shane. Thanks for uh, thanks for sharing all that. I I have to say that I completely disagree, and that I think people should only use large telescopes. But uh, you know, you gave it a good. No, it's very good. Very good. <laughs> Yeah, no, well, was... um, and, and, and some, like there's definitely that crowd out there, right. That, um, they really just love big aperture and, and that's fine. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, I just got sick and tired for the most part of the storage and the lugging it around. And, and I just found that I would use my 12 inch light bridge a couple times a year, you know, when I would go yeah. out to grasslands, whereas I use my refractors like multiple times a week. Yeah. And I mean, there's some, there's something you said, like, you know, here in your last slide, like the right tool for the right job kind of thing. Like even, even when I was out the other night and I was looking at NGC 6633, they're a little uh, open cluster uh, up and off Eucas, just, just on the border towards serpents. Um, you know, in, in fact, like in my, in my four inch using only 19 power, uh, I'm almost blowing it apart. Right. It, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's really beyond the, the power, um, and magnification that that a telescope provides, and actually in my in my uh, eight by fifty finder, it was awesome. Like that was honestly the best view of it. So there, we, there we go. I think there are a lot of, and there's a lot of objects out there like that. And in fact, you know, uh, I totally disagree that, that your list is just a little short at the start. Like, I mean, some of those objects that are smaller um, actually do do um, show really, really well in the, uh, in the, in the small scopes, uh, and better like than than like my four inch, which is still a small scope, I guess. But, uh, but I, I think there's way more objects that, that your small scopes will, uh, will outperform the bigger ones on I, again, like that, that cluster there, um, is, is well small enough to fit in, in the range of, of like an eight inch or, or larger telescope. But by, by the time I got to four inches, it's still blowing it apart too much. So I, I really think that, uh, that, that some of these objects, which people would look at and say, oh, well, you know, that, that one's really not much to look at. I only see a few stars. Like you'd have to pan across it in order to see the stars. And, you know, it looks like you can fit tractor trailers end for end between the stars. Doesn't really look like much is, is absolutely gorgeous in a, in a 50 millimeter telescope. So anyway, that, that's the only point I disagree with you on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's fair. You know, the, the best way to me uh, to observe is to have a, a couple of observing buddies or whatever amount. And yeah. if you have all varying uh, apertures, like, yeah. you know, I love when we go out and Mike is there with his 12, yeah. um, you know, and, and you or I sometimes would have a five inch refractor. Um, you know, I think last time we were out at grasslands, Mike had the 12, I had the hundred and uh, the hundred millimeter teleview and you had right. the 60 millimeter tack. Yeah. And it's just so cool when you have, you know, all of these different apertures that all specialize in different things. And, yeah. you know, you can sort of pick the right object for each telescope or do that comparison where you put one object in all three telescopes and just kind of see what it looks like. But yeah, no, no, exactly. That, that really is, is the best way. And, and barring that, I think like, uh, you know, is, is the using of, of small binoculars in the, you know, the 30 to, to maximum 50 millimeter range. Um, you know, I, I do still repeatedly hear people saying, oh, you, you know, you recommended a 40, I, I recommend eight by 40 millimeter binoculars. I think that's like the ideal sort of, sort of set in a way it has just enough power that it really can, can magnify the sky and just enough aperture that it really brings in a lot of sky without being too heavy to handhold. But, uh, but I still get lots of people who, who will go out and buy like a, a 15 by, by 70 or, or, or 20 by 70 or whatever they sell. Um, and there's nothing wrong with those binoculars. They're perfectly fine. They're just, in my opinion, they're kind of big and, and hard to hold. And, um, the field of view just, just isn't as, as wide, you know, and, and the same goes for these small telescopes is that, you know, easy to uh, lug around. And then they have that, that beautiful low power wide field for, for finding, uh, things really, really fast and finding lots of stuff and, and really showing it, uh, not greatly diminished compared to, uh, to larger apertures. Yeah. Well, you know what, Chris, I think that is a perfect way to end uh, this episode. That's Sounds a good. Great, great summary. So thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you to everybody for listening. Thank you. Thank you everyone for listening. And we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com. <laughs>